evening, everybody. I am glad that you have joined us here at Bethalto Church of God, our Life University online. Thank you for, um, I keep wanting to say tune in. I don't think that's the proper terminology for being on the internet, but I'm glad that you're here with us. I want to ask you if you would take just a moment before we get started. Would you share this? Would you just hit that share button and share this video on your profile? It helps get the word out there, lets people see. Maybe people uh, that are wanting to see it, that have just kind of forgotten what time it was, or maybe even somebody out there that maybe hasn't even intended on watching it, but they're scrolling by and they see that you've shared it. Maybe it can do something good for them. So if you would take just a moment and share that. And we're going to have a song. As I promised, don't worry, I'm not going to do any singing. I'm going to let my girls take care of that. And uh, we're going we're gonna to pray, we're going to sing a song, and then we're going to get into the Word tonight. So would you join me in a word of prayer? Father, we just thank you and praise you so much. Thank you for this night. I thank you for everyone, everyone that is joining us tonight, whether it be by Facebook Live, whether it be later on on YouTube. I thank you for them taking the time to join with us in this time of, of worship, in this time of discipleship. And we just pray that you would just anoint everything that is said and done. Let it be, first of all, to bring glory and honor to you. And then also that, Lord, people can be edified and people can be encouraged people can be discipled. Lord, I know that your word will not return void, but it will accomplish that which has been set forth to do. God, we just give you the praise, the thanks, and the honor. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. Join us tonight, and we're going to sing an old song that most of you probably know, I'll Fly Away. helping me out tonight. I appreciate it so much. And we are, again, we're glad if you're just joining us, thank you so much for joining us here tonight, Life University online. I appreciate you taking this time and being with us. Uh, tonight, I want to uh, talk to you on the subject, as you've seen it already on the TV beside me, is crossing the Jordan. And uh, we're going to go, hopefully you got your Bible or your iPad or tablet or something with you. I want you to, if you will, get that. Obviously you're at home, so you can run and get it if you need to. Run, grab your Bible, run and grab a pen and some paper. Take some notes tonight. It's kind of a 
teaching night. Maybe I might preach a little bit. I don't know. I kind of felt a little bit of preach last Wednesday night. So uh, if you will, join with me. We're going to be talking about crossing the Jordan. We're going to go to the book of Joshua, of course, talking about that. Most of you could probably guess. We're going to go to the book of Joshua, chapter 3, and verse 1. Scripture says this, And Joshua rose early in the morning, and they removed from Shittim and came to Jordan, he and all the children of Israel, and lodged there before they passed over. See, the book of Joshua is a very important book. In chapter 1, it describes God's challenge to Joshua and his assurances to his faith. Let me remind you that Joshua is taking the reins of leadership of the nation of Israel, and he is following a uh, very prominent uh, a very long time leader uh, by the name of Moses, uh, a man that needs no introduction. If you've heard much about the Bible, you know about Moses. Moses was a man mightily used of the Lord. As all men, he had faults and he had flaws, but uh, these were some very large shoes to fill that Joshua had. In chapter 1, uh, is talk, God is talking to Joshua and giving him assurances that God is going to be with him. In fact, God says, just as I was with Moses, so I'm going to be with you. And can I take just one moment here and just remind somebody tonight as you're watching uh, that the Lord would say the same thing to you, just as the Lord was with Moses just as the Lord was with Joshua, just as the Lord was with so many men and women in the scriptures, just as the Lord is with the pastor, just as the Lord has been with other pastors in the past, God Almighty is with you. He's with you in this pandemic. He's with you in the current crises that you are facing in your life. God hasn't left you alone. Chapter 2 then describes... Uh, the two spies who were sent out to search the land secretly and how God provided for their deliverance through Rahab. And their report we find in the book of Joshua chapter 2 and verse 23. In fact, if you've got it, we'll, pro- we'll probably go back here again at some point, but let's just look at it real quick. Then the two men started back. They went down out of the hills, forded the river, and came to Joshua, son of Nun, told him everything that happened to them. They said to Joshua, the Lord has surely given the whole land into our hands. All the people are melting in fear because of us. You see, Joshua believed that surely it was God's will to cross into the land and possess it, so he wasted no time. Now, if you think back just uh, a a book or two backwards and uh, a few years backwards, about 40 years backwards from the time of this story, you'll remember that 12 spies were sent out. 12 spies were sent out to spy out the land of Canaan. And Moses was the leader at the time. He was the sender. And most of you can remember that there were 10 spies that came out with a negative report. They all agreed that the land was good, that the land was flowing with milk and honey. It was a land that anybody would want. Uh, But 10 of them, all 12 agreed on that, but 10 of them said, but there's too many giants in the land. It's too, we, we just cannot take this land. But two came back and said, we can take this land, one of those being Joshua, the other one being Caleb. And Joshua believed that surely it was God's will to come into the land and possess it. So he wasted absolutely no time in doing this once he now had the go-ahead from God. Because I'll remind you, Joshua and Caleb had now waited 40 years for this to happen. And I, I hate to stop here and, and sound just too, too, uh, uh, too chasing rabbits, but it's not really a rabbit trail when it's right here in the Scripture to just remind somebody that, that God's promises are going to come to pass in your life. Sometimes you just got to wait a little bit longer than you wanted to. Joshua was a man 
and Caleb were men that had been waiting 40 long years to possess this promised land that 40 years earlier they had said, hey, hey, we can do it. We believe we can take this land, uh, but, but nobody else was in agreement, and therefore a generation had to die out in the wilderness before they could finally do this. And so uh, now at this point, Joshua was in command. Joshua was the leader, and he wanted to waste no time to possess this land. Verse 1 indicates that he rose early in the morning and got the nation to begin moving. You see, Joshua wasted no time. We read that in verse 1. It said early in the morning. Joshua got up and got ready. You know, most of you can think about some things that that you get up early for. Uh, And I'm talking about things you want to get up early for. Some of you have to get up early to go to work and you don't necessarily want to do that. Uh, But think back to some things. I have to admit, my sisters would make fun of me a little bit probably and they may get on here and do it at some point. Uh, I can remember as, as a kid, I was, got super excited about Christmas morning. And uh, I kind of feel sorry for my parents, you know, and I do believe we reap what we sow. But some way, somehow, the Lord had mercy on me. And our girls, uh, I guess they just like sleep better than I did. And neither one of them got up. I mean, I got up. I set my alarm for like four in the morning on Christmas morning because I was excited about Christmas morning. I was excited about getting under that Christmas tree and getting those presents. It was an exciting time. And I, whenever we're excited about things, I, I think about, and my wife will make fun of me on this as well. And she says that I get ex- really excited about two things Christmas and, and youth camp. And, you know, around that time of year, I usually get excited and I, I'm ready. I'm ready to get up. I'm ready to get going. And this was something that Joshua was extremely excited about. He was ready again. Joshua had been waiting. 40 long years and so on finally when God gives him the clearance and it's time to go in he gets up early and he starts waking everybody up I don't I don't know I I give me just a little bit of liberty here I don't know what they had obviously they didn't have any kind of PA system uh, but uh, they did have trumpets of some sort and I just got to believe that Joshua when he woke up early that morning he got the trumpet out or got the trumpeteer out and said get everybody awake it's early and somebody said boss it's early this morning said, I don't care we're getting up early we're about to get going we're going to possess the land that God has promised and I've been waiting on for 40 years. But between them and the land of abundance was an obstacle. And that obstacle was a pretty formidable obstacle. And that obstacle was the Jordan River. You see, there will always be challenges between you and your promise, between your, you and your blessing and your destiny. Some reason or another, we've got it in our heads as Christians many times that, oh, if it's God's will, it's going to come about easy. If it's God's will, he's just going to lay it in your hands. I, I got to tell you folks, everywhere I read in this book, I don't find that at all. In fact, many times we find it can be difficult. It can be difficult waiting. It can be difficult some of the tests and the challenges that God allows us to go through and puts us through before we get there. There will always be challenges between you and your promise, between you and your blessing, between you and your destiny. You see, humanly speaking, to cross the Jordan was an impossibility. Because verse 15 indicates that it was a time of overflow, that the river was in flood stages. And at this time in the world, there were no bridges and only a few fords, and these were impassable during this flood season. We in this modern world are so accustomed, if you were to leave uh, the Metro East right now to go over to St. Louis, there are a number of bridges that you could go across, nice bridges. You could go up to Alton and you could go across the Alton Bridge there on Highway 67 and you could see that nice suspension bridge and you'd be far above the water. Uh, Then you could go over to Uh, You could get on 55, and you could go across the Poplar Street Bridge. Not nearly as pretty, but still 
far above the water and will get the job done. You could get on 70 and you could go across that new suspension bridge. They're working on, I think, the Martin Luther King Bridge, the 255, excuse me, the 270 Bridge, and then the 255 Bridge down below. There are many ways just to get across the Mississippi River in our modern mindset Crossing a river uh, is just, it's just not that hard of a thing. But in this day and time, to cross a river in flood stages, especially if you were about to take a nation of people and all their stuff, you were looking at an impossibility to do at this time and this season. I mean, how could they cross with women, with children, with baggage? I mean, I don't want to get any hate mail or any or any mean comments, but let's just be honest. I can remember uh, whenever uh, Jaden was young and, and Molly Kate was in the womb, uh, we were taking a trip. We were still in the area, pastoring over at Beltline, and we were taking a trip down to Panama City Beach for vacation. And uh, we had packed up and, and we had a car at the time. And I can remember looking back at all the things that, that Jamie had packed. And um, the trunk of the car was full. And I remember looking back in the back seat, and I could see Jaden back there. And the rest of the seat, the half seat in the middle and the other side was piled full of stuff. The trunk was, well, I mean, the trunk was full, the seats were full, and Jaden had her little space over there. And I said, how in the world are we going to travel around once this new kid is born and we've got even more equipment with it. I, I'm not going to say that women pack heavy, but I'll just say that my wife likes to make sure that we have everything that we could possibly need or want when we go on a trip. So let's just think about you have an entire nation with all of their stuff and you're about to have to cross a river that is currently in flood stage. Let me just assure somebody that you're going through some stuff right now and it seems impossible. You're going through some stuff right now and, and, and it almost seems that impossible. Like you're trying to get an entire nation with all of your belongings across a river in flood stage. But I'm thankful tonight that I serve a God that is in the business of taking people through impossible situations. You see, the historical fact is that the people did cross the flooding Jordan to enter that land. You see, God had a plan, and in his power, he performed it. Remember this, whatever you're going through, God has a plan. You may be looking at a flooded river with your wife and your kids or your husband and your kids and all of your stuff, and it seems like an impossibility that you're ever going to get across this flooded river. But let me assure you tonight, God has a plan, and in his power, he will perform it. Just like God had the power to get the Israelites across the Jordan River, God has got a plan and He's got the power to get you across your obstacle, your impossibility that you are facing. Chapter 3 describes step by step God's plan, how they were to move when the priests moved the ark. God gives them specific instructions. The priests were to lead the way before the people. And when they came to the Jordan, the priests then were to stand still in it. In fact, let's go to the Word and look at that with me, if you will, in verses 13 through 17. Again, we're in chapter 3 of the book of Joshua, if you're just joining us. And as soon as the priests who carry the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, set foot in the Jordan, its waters flowing downstream will be cut off and stand up in a heap. So when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. Now the Jordan is at flood stage all during harvest. Yet as soon as the priests who carried the Ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. 
it piled up in a heap a great distance away at a town called Adam in the vicinity of Zarethan, while the water flowing down to the sea of Arabah, the salt sea, was completely cut off. So the people crossed over opposite Jericho. The priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the middle of the Jordan while all Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. You see, we find according to the scripture that God told them, let the priests go. Let the priests get their feet in the water as they're carrying the Ark of the Covenant. At that point, the waters were stopped and began to pile up uh, upstream where downstream everything went dry because the waters were stopped. And we find that the priests then were instructed to go and stand in the middle of the Jordan River as the rest of the nation then passed through on dry land. So why was there such an urgency about this? Why was it necessary to go into the land at this precise time? Why not wait? until the river was down and not flooding. You know, I try to think that I'm a a man of, of faith, and I also know that I'm a man of practicality a lot. And my practical mind would think, you know what, we don't have to go over it this time of year. We've waited 40 years. We might as well go ahead and wait until the drier season when it will be much easier to get everybody across this river. But there are several answers to this question. Number one, it was God's timing and God's timing is always perfect. I'm going to read that one more time. One reason was it was God's timing and God's timing is always perfect. It is always a struggle for us as human beings when we struggle with God's timing because I have come to find out in my 40 years here on this planet and and serving God just about every single one of those, I have come to find out that God's timing and my timing rarely coincide. In fact, most of the time when I think it's God's time and something should happen, it does not happen. But then when I'm not even thinking about it and don't even think it's even close to time, bam, God Almighty brings it to pass. So let me tell somebody watching tonight that God's timing is much different than your timing and God's timing is always perfect in the life of Israel, in the life of everyone in the scriptures and in the life of you and me here in 2020. You see, the second reason to this was it was also God's opportunity to demonstrate his power as seen in verse 10. Look with me, chapter 3 of the book of Joshua again, verse 10. This is how you will know that the living God is among you and that he will certainly Drive out before you the Canaanites and a whole list of all those ites that live in the land of Canaan. So God specifically says, this is how you're going to know that the living God is among you. This was God's opportunity to demonstrate his power to a new generation. Remember, we talked about that they've been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. And the reason for that was the previous generation had died because they did not believe that God would take them into the promised land. And God said, this generation's got to die out. And the only two left were Joshua and Caleb, the two that believed that, that God could bring them into the land. And so that previous generation had seen, they had seen the plagues on Egypt. They had seen the Red Sea parted. They had seen water from a rock twice. They had seen all this kind of stuff. And this generation had, they'd seen manna from heaven and they'd seen things, but they hadn't seen all the different miracles that the previous generation had seen. And I believe that God needed two things here, two groups of people. And and that was the new generation of Israel he wanted them to see that but not only that he wanted the nations ahead in Canaan to also demonstrate it yeah countries had heard before of how God had destroyed Pharaoh and the Red Sea 40 years earlier it was all kind but you know how we as people are we tend to forget sometimes and God wanted a 
fresh reminder in the minds of everybody, both his people and the heathens over across the river. He wanted a fresh reminder in people's minds that he is still he was still God then and he's still God today my how I long how I long in 2020 would God Almighty through his people one more time remind this world that he is still an almighty God in this corona crisis in this pandemic in this shelter in place crazy time my my would it be wonderful if God would just one more time this side of eternity show himself mighty and powerful and let the critics all be silenced by seeing the kind of powerful God He is. The third reason, it provided an opportunity for the Israelites to exercise their faith. Now, that's that's one that you don't want to. This is Wednesday night teaching here. Uh, If you popped on here tonight, uh, you may be saying, "Eh, I don't know if I want to hear this tonight. You see, it provided an opportunity for the Israelites to exercise their faith. I just need to let you know that God is going to provide opportunities that exercise your faith faith. I know we don't like to lie. We want to talk about the victory. We want to talk about the blessings. We want to talk about the easy part. But the fact of the matter is God is going to allow you to face things in your life. God is going to let you go through some stuff that are going to be an opportunity to exercise your faith. Why is it? Well, in Israel's case, they were about to have to cross a Jordan River and they were about to have to face first right out of the gate a big fortified city called Jericho and they needed a little faith builder to get across the river to prepare them for what was I feel God in this even with just three of us in this sanctuary tonight I feel God in this God had to get them through a little thing to build their faith to get them to the next thing I need to tell somebody watching tonight God is doing the same thing in you he's got to get you through some things to build your faith faith so that you're ready for the next thing. God's taking you through this to build your faith that if God can get you through this, then the next thing that you face, you can look back and say, well, God brought me through that. So I believe that God can bring me through this. I've got to keep going. Finally, it was God's way of magnifying Joshua. And this was very important because the, to the people, because Joshua was to be God's instrument for leadership. I kind of I kind of got ahead of myself a little bit as I do sometimes at the beginning of this. And 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 the fact is that Joshua was was taking the reins from Moses. And and this was a this was not an easy thing. I mean, Moses was a proven leader. Moses was a stable leader. Moses had been with this generation. Again, remember, this is a generation that the previous generation had gone in 40 years of wandering. They died out. And so Moses was the only leader that this current generation now in Joshua's day had ever known. This generation really didn't remember a whole lot. They were kids. They didn't remember a whole lot of Egypt. They were either kids or they were born in the wilderness. You know, they didn't really remember Pharaoh. They didn't really remember building the pyramids. They didn't really remember any of that kind of stuff. What they did remember was Moses. Moses has always been our leader. Moses has always been the one that heard from God and did all of these things. Uh, But God had to do something to let the people know that there was, can I say it like this, that there was a new sheriff in town, and he was God's man who God was about to use and anoint to bring about the destiny that he wanted to bring. And so God wanted to be able to show that just like he told Joshua, just as I was with Moses, so I'm going to be with you. And God not only needed Joshua to understand that, God needed the people to understand that. That's why. That's why. There's two truths. Some of you are panicking because if you've been looking here, you've seen that this still says introduction. And you're panicking. You're like, dear Lord, how long is this going to be? Well, Jamie and the girls asked me uh, after Sunday, they're like, just how many points did you have Sunday? I said, I had nine points this past Sunday. Don't worry, I only have two tonight. So that's why I could take a little longer in the introduction and these two points are not very long at all. So there are two things that I want to share with you about this experience tonight. Number one, the significance of crossing the Jordan. 
You see, for Israel, the significance of crossing the Jordan was a definite historical experience in which the people left the desert life to enter into the land of abundance. Again, they'd been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years because of their unbelief, because of their, their, their lack of faith in God, and kind of going back to last week as we talked about the worst sin in the Bible, which again, as we talked about, it's really that, that root sin, uh, unbelief, because of unbelief, um, that previous generation did not get to make it into the promise. Now, even Moses, not because of his unbelief, but because, remember, the Lord spoke to him. Or, well, I guess it really was. Now I'm, I'm figuring this out just as I'm talking to you. There was, of course, a source of unbelief in there. God had told him previously, strike the rock and water will come forth, and it did. And then the second time the Lord told Moses, he said, speak to the rock. Uh, But Moses, for apparently for some reason or other, probably the root being in unbelief, he struck the rock again instead of speaking to the rock. And that was then that the Lord told Moses, he said, Moses, you are not going to enter into the promised land. So again, goes back for that older generation, only two men were going to enter into the promised land. This was was a a definite historical experience. and, And it was taking them from this 40 years, this generation, that's really all that they knew was wandering around in the wilderness, this nomadic life uh, of, uh, of gathering this bread that falls out of the sky every day except for the Sabbath and living this life where their sandals didn't wear out and their clothes didn't wear out and they got water from rocks and all this miraculous stuff. God was moving them from this desert life into this land of abundance. The victory was miraculously given and God magnified himself in his plan of conquering the land. You see, God was about to show himself mighty and taking this ragtag group of former slaves, former wilderness wanderers, and take them into a land with walled cities, this land with abundant supply, and enable them to conquer this land and nobody was going to say, listen, if Egypt had went in and conquered the land, they'd have said, oh, yeah, it was a mighty military. Uh, There's a mighty military nation. They, they had all kind of chariots and weapons. They know how to fight. But listen, these Israelites, they were not warriors. And so God wanted to receive glory for this. And the people showed commitment by going into the land and entering into warfare to possess the land and enjoy its benefits. Now, We're rough on them, and I I am too. We're rough on that previous generation that did not believe that God could take them in. Now, they had done seen a lot of miracles. They had seen a lot of faith-building things that God had done, and he had brought the most powerful nation in the world, Egypt, to its knees at the time of that first generation as we talk about in the, in the Exodus experience and now into, into Joshua as they go into camp. That first generation there, they'd seen a lot of stuff, but let's just, let's just be honest. They knew it too. What they, what they knew was making bricks. What they knew was being slaves to the Egyptians. What they really didn't know was warfare. Obviously, the Egyptians, they, they didn't want the Israelites to know. You Believe you me, the Israel, uh, excuse me, the Egyptians made sure that the Israelites didn't know anything about warfare because they didn't want them to rise up. That's why Pharaoh had put them into slavery anyway because he was afraid of them rising up and rebelling against him. And so this group of people knew nothing about warfare. And so it took some faith. For this group of people who were not warriors, they were brick makers, they were wilderness wonders, it took some faith for them to say, hey, I believe we can go into this land, I believe we can, there's giants there, there's walled cities there, but God said we can do it, and so I believe we can do it. So let's not not pull any punches here, let's not be naive It took some faith, and there's some junk that some of y'all are facing tonight too, that it takes some faith for you to believe that God is going to get you through it and bring you through it. But brothers and sisters listening tonight, listen, get the faith. If it's in this book, believe it. If God said it, believe it and have faith to know that God is going to do it. It was significant. You see, for us, crossing the Jordan is not symbolic of entering heaven. It is symbolic of the Christian entering in to the abundant life that God has promised in 
Jesus Christ. Now, I'm going to burst some of your bubbles here, and some of you may not like this. It is not passing into eternity. It illustrates passing from one level of Christian experience to another level in the Lord. You see, because Egypt in Israel's life was representative of sin and bondage. Sometimes we church people, we you know, we talk about, oh, we're going to cross that chilly Jordan and go over to the other side. Well, listen, let, let's put this into perspective here uh, of crossing the chilly Jordan and getting to the other side. I hope to goodness that the representation of crossing the chilly Jordan and getting to the promised land is not heaven uh, when it comes to this story and the representation here because uh, they had to face giants, they had trouble, they had sickness, they had all the regular stuff of life. I don't know about y'all, but everything I read about heaven, uh, I'm not going to have trouble. I'm not going to have sickness. I'm not going to have issues. There's not going to be. There's not going to be people I've got to fight. There's going to be no more battles or no more war. So therefore, uh, when we talk about, sometimes we get caught up in that. So the significance of crossing the Jordan is not that that life to death and passing into heaven experience. Really, the the significance of the story of crossing the Jordan is more about what happens here when we commit our lives to Christ and we begin to live a new life. Uh, Because we're going, Israel represented, anytime you read about Egypt in the scriptures, is representative of sin, it's representative of the bondage of sin, and we are leaving when we become saved and we become a believer, we're leaving that life of bondage and slavery to sin, and we are crossing in to a land of freedom. Does it mean that we're not going to have any more pain? No. Does it mean we're not going to have any more suffering? No. But it does mean that we're no longer slaves to the former life that we used to live. The deliverance from Egypt miraculously was representative of salvation, that new birth and spiritual deliverance. The wilderness in the life of Israel was representative of the carnal life of a Christian who live in, in self-centeredness, defeat, discouragement, and unbelief. And it included both conflict and rest, but it also had the abundant life that God had promise. You see, Canaan was representative of the victorious Christian life. Here's the deal. They cross over into Canaan. God helped them. God got them free from slavery to sin to Egypt, and he brought them into Canaan. And yes, they had to fight battles. Yes, they had to, they had to have faith for God to get them through some stuff. It involved both conflict and times of rest, but yet it was a much more abundant life than they had before. Even though some of the older generation before them that didn't believe they even though they kept saying wow why'd you bring us out here to die it'd be better to just be slaves and it were there not any graves in Egypt could we not have just died over there absolutely not that silliness because what they were about to face in Canaan though it was not representative of perfection in heaven yet it was still much better so let me just say this ain't it so much better or excuse me um, uh, my southernness is coming out there isn't it so much better uh, to live this Christian life oh it's not perfect it's not free from difficulties it's not free from having some hardships but it sure is better from the life of sin and the life of bondage and the junk that the devil had me in before I'm thankful for this life. So let's look now at the secret to crossing the Jordan. What is the secret to crossing the Jordan? How are we to do it? For Israel, the secret of crossing the Jordan was listening to God's words and obeying them as seen in verse 9. And I'm going to put this up on the screen for you. And Joshua said unto the children of Israel, come hither and hear the words of the Lord your God. You see, it was listening to God's words and obey them. Joshua said, he's like, come here. Everybody come in here. Almost like a really big huddle because there were like over a million of them at this point. But Joshua said, hey, listen, y'all, y'all come here. Y'all come here. I, I need to talk to you, and I need to tell you not my words, but I need to tell you about the words of our Heavenly Father. I need you to hear the words of the Lord, and then after you listen to them, I need you to 
obey them. I don't have time tonight, and it's not the night to do it, of talking about, listen, you can hear it and still not obey it, but you need to hear it, and you need to obey the word of the Lord. If we want to live in victory, if we want to cross that Jordan in our life and get to that next level and that next place, uh, we've got to listen. And not only do we need to listen, but we need to obey. Listen, you can listen to preaching all day long. You can get on Facebook tonight. You can listen to me and 500 other preachers tonight. You can listen to a podcast all day long. You can listen to as much preaching as your heart desires. And that's one thing that we've been thankful for, that even in this time of, of this uh, quarantine, and, and there's been more preaching and more church and more gospel on social media than there ever has been. And I'm thankful for that. But listen, just listening ain't going to do you nothing. you got to listen and you've got to obey the words of the Lord. It was also by following the Ark of the Covenant in faith, by in other words, by following the leading of the Holy Spirit. Church, I can't remind you enough that it is important that we follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. Now, you know I say this all the time. Anytime I talk about following the leading of the Holy Spirit, because it's important to me, the Holy Spirit will never re lead you in opposition to this book right here, but he will lead you. And as long as it lines up with this book and you know it's the Lord and you know it's the Spirit leading you, then you better go where the Spirit leads you. You see, this required cleanse lives, as in verse 5, and confidence in God's promises and power. I want you to look at me with these verses. Joshua chapter 3, verses 5, 7, and 11. And Joshua said unto the people, sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. So he, first of all, it required cleanse lives. Joshua said, listen, we're about to get in here, we're about to hear from the Lord, but before you get close to his presence, before you hear from him, you need to sanctify yourselves. And I know I've, I preached on this a few weeks ago, and I try to make sure that I preach on it uh, as often as I need to. The fact and the, and the scriptures and the doctrine of sanctification, you can't just live any old way you want to live. You need to live a holy, sanctified life. That's not my opinion. That's not the opinion of the denomination. That's the opinion of God in heaven all throughout his word that we're to live sanctified. Joshua said, sanctify yourselves. Then Verse 7, and the Lord said unto Joshua, this day will I begin to magnify thee in the sight of all Israel that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. And then in verse 11, behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth passeth over before you in Jordan. You see, they needed cleansed lives. They needed confidence in God's promise. The, Joshua needed it too. Hey, the leaders need it. The preacher needs it. Hey, all of us, we've got to have confidence in the promise of God. Sometimes I think, and I don't, I'm not minimizing anybody, so, but sometimes I think us as leaders, we might need it a little bit more that, that we have the promise. God is saying, listen, one more time, boy, I need you to get this in your head. I need you to understand that just like I was with Moses, I'm going to be with God you and we understand and we have confidence in that promise and we have confidence in his power chapter 3 contains 10 references to the ark and according to this chapter it was the key to the victory Israel had over the Jordan River now the ark of the covenant you say what was the ark I haven't been able to do this in a little while so if you're watching with somebody else there on the couch, there's somebody else, just punch your neighbor, uh, or maybe they're too far in, over in the recliner somewhere else, and, and you just at least throw something at them maybe and, and, and say, what was the ark? i got to take a drink of water. Come on, do it. So hit somebody beside you. Be careful, though. I saw somebody 
I shared today a, a, the little, a little thing about uh, you better be good to your spouse, whoever you're living with there, because um, they could poison you, and every death right now is being blamed on corona. So, you know, you want to be careful who you're living with. They might kill you, and, it not, and they get away with it. So, so don't, don't hit them too hard. So what was the ark? Well, it was the most important piece of furniture in the tabernacle. And it represented the presence of God. I don't have time tonight. I'm going to do it. You know, and I, I thought about doing it while we're in this online time of doing a study on the tabernacle. But I think I'm going to wait till we're actually in building again together. And I'm going to do a study on the tabernacle and the temple. Uh, but it, if you've studied the tabernacle and the temple, you know that the ark represents the presence of God. I've preached on that many times before also. It contained the two tables of stone on which the law was written by the finger of God, and it represented the awesome power, holiness, and the presence of the living God. It resided in the holy of holies, God's continual dwelling place with humanity it represented the presence of the lord and for us the ark is a type of the person of the lord jesus christ because on the ark was a cover of gold called the mercy seat and this mercy seat represents jesus christ who was god's propitiation through his blood you can go even deeper and you can find and when you do studies on it, you find that the ark was, first of all, it was wood, which represented the humanity of Jesus, overlaid with gold, which represented the divineness of Jesus. And we, so just as the Israelites were to focus their attention on the ark, so are we to focus our attention on Christ. You see, we're not to focus our attention on our frustrations, our circumstances, or surroundings, but we are to keep our eyes on Jesus Christ. I got just a few more minutes, but you know, you've heard, you've heard me preach about this. You've heard so many other preachers preach about this, but it comes back to that old thing. You got to keep your eyes on Jesus. You see, they didn't have this privilege. They didn't have the Ark of the Covenant. Last time they crossed a body of water, the Red Sea, it was not there. And so Moses stretched his rod out over the sea. And as the song said, the Lord answered Moses with a gentle, little gentle breeze. They crossed over. It stayed open. And then the Lord told him after they all got over and Pharaoh got in the middle of it, he said, stretch it out again. And the waters collapsed on Pharaoh and all the Egyptian armies and, and saved them from Pharaoh. But this was different, different in the fact, as we talked about before, that, that before then, uh, God said, I want, I want you to send the priests, and they're carrying the Ark of the Covenant, and on the end, the, the poles are through, uh, through the holes, or through, the, through those uh, holes in there, and it's, the rods are through there, and it's sitting on the feet of the priests, and the priests are going to step, and they're going to put their feet in the waters of the Jordan, and then as their feet went in, the waters then begin to pile up upstream and dried up downstream but differently than the red sea crossing he said i want the priest to then as the waters part i want them to go and stand in the middle and i want them to stand right there and as they're going to stand in the middle as the rest of the million people cross over on dry land why was that because God wanted the people. Now these people were aware of what this box represented. This ark represented the presence of the Lord, was a representation of Jesus Christ. And as those, as those kids, as those parents, as those, as those uh, people were crossing over this dry, dried up riverbed and seeing dry downstream and, and, and seeing water piling up upstream and they looked and they saw the present, the representation of the presence of the Lord. He wanted them to realize for the battles as we've already talked about, for the battles that 
that were coming ahead, he wanted them to realize who it was that was getting them through this. As they're walking through this, like God would later say in his word, when you pass through the waters, I'm going to be with you. God wants you right now as you're walking through the stuff that you're walking through He wants you when you to get to the other side and you look back and you see all the stuff, you see the stuff coming against, you see how there's water piling up, there's problems piling up, you see that that if something broke loose, you'd die. But yet when you made it through on the other side, God wants you not to focus on the problems. He doesn't want you to focus on the bad. What he wants you to remember is right right in the middle of it. He wants you to remember that he was right there with you. Just I could preach for a little while tonight. Just like he was in the fiery furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Just like he was there in the lion's den with Daniel. Just like that. He was right there in the middle of the parting of the Jordan River. That big obstacle that stood in between them and their destiny. Jesus Christ was there with him and God's wanting somebody listening tonight to know that what you're going through don't look at the problem but look at the presence don't look at what's trying to destroy you but look to the one that is there with you yea though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death I will fear no evil why but what because there's no evil there no absolutely not there's evil there but I'm not going to fear why because Thou art with me. That God is in the middle of the problem with me. And it's going to be God that gets me through it. If anybody was in here tonight, I'd ask you to just stand up and give God praise for a minute. But maybe you can there in your living room or where you're at tonight. The secret, I'm almost done. The secret to crossing the Jordan. The spiritual victory over the self-life into a Christ-controlled life is related to three steps to victory. Number one, we must desire sincerely to be victorious. Joshua 1 and 16 indicates that the people were willing and eager to enter the land. Look with me, Joshua chapter 1 and verse 16. Look at it with me, if you will. I want you to see it. Then they answered Joshua, whatever you have commanded us, we will do. And wherever you send us, we will go. My, what a difference between generations. The previous generation had told Moses, ah, no, no, I don't think we're going to do this. Don't think we can do it. Too many giants, too tough, too difficult. Ah, you just want to get us, take us over there and we're going to get killed. Let's, let's just go back. Oh, I miss, I miss eating the onions and the leeks over in Egypt. Why, let's just go back there. My, what a difference in a journey. My God, I, I'm praying for my girls. I'm praying, God, raise my girls, raise my children, raise this new generation up with a better attitude than my generation has had. Raise up a generation that was at whatever you've commanded us. We will do, and wherever you send us, we will go. It is that kind of attitude that God is looking for in his people. Secondly, to confess our sins and be cleansed. First John 1, 9, 1 and 9 says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Joshua had said, hey, folks, we talked about this, sanctify yourselves Clean yourselves up. We're about, to, we're about to get in God's presence, and God's about to do some great things in us, but you're going to have to get your life cleaned up. It's a great part. I don't know why people get so tore up and mad at God and just say God's just trying to ruin their lives and don't want them to have any fun. I mean, you're acting like you won't even forget. All you got to do, he said, you feel confess your sins. He's faithful and just to forgive you of them. I mean, it's not like God is saying, oh, you messed up, it's over. No, no hope for you. No, he said, look, confess them. And he's faithful and just to forgive you of them and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And we need to, we've got to surrender by faith to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is God's plan of victory for us. As the ark led the Israelites to victory, so does Jesus Christ lead us to victory. Keep our eyes on 
Jesus. As we end this tonight, it's not God's will for any person to live in Egypt spiritually. God wants to, and I'm hoping, I'm hoping that during the Rona, while you've been locked up at home, I'm hoping and praying, I, and I've heard, I've heard from a lot of different people that have said they've been able to grow spiritually during this time. They have been able to, they've spent more time in prayer. They've spent more time in the Word. They've spent more time, and God has touched them. And God, listen, I'm praying that this, even though there's been a lot of bad things to it, one of the good things, I'm hoping and praying that God's going to get some folks out of Egypt spiritually during this time. God doesn't want you to stay in that. He wants you to, he is not willing that any should perish. Neither is God's will for any Christian to live in the wilderness spiritually. Listen, God doesn't want anybody to just barely get by spiritually. He wants you to live a life. A life. Jesus said, I've come to give it you life and give it more abundantly. Jesus didn't come and give his life so that you could just barely make it and barely scrape by. He said, I've come that you might have life and you might have it more abundantly. Listen, I know some folks that they've got life they ain't got it more abundantly. It's my desire. I want to have life, and I want to not just have life, but I want to have it more abundantly. And it's my desire as a pastor that you not just make it by and just barely get by, but it's my desire that you have life and that you have it more abundantly. Not in the way that the world says, live it up. The only way that it truly will bless you, and that is when God blesses you. It is God's will to enter uh, into the land of Canaan spiritually to cross over to Jordan, to experience the power of God in our lives and to make ourselves available to him now. Folks, I, I, know, I know that the human part of us, uh, we, we just kind of, we kind of rather not. We'd rather not have to face it if we possibly could get away with it. We'd rather not have our faith tested. We'd rather not have to go through the tough things we'd rather the human part of us would rather have it easy but folks it, it just that's not God's plan it's not God's way God is going to let us go through some stuff that is going to strengthen us I just tell you I, I, some of you know I don't look like it but I, I do, I enjoy going to the gym. Since all this has happened, the gym's been shut down for well over a month. And uh, I don't have a, I went to, went to look online and get some of those adjustable. I don't want a whole rack of dumbbells. And I think Bowflex makes these adjustable dumbbells. And finding them's impossible right now. If you can find them, they're like 1000 bucks or something like that. So, so I can't, can't lift weights right now, which is what I really enjoy. Uh, what I hate to do is run, but the only thing I can do is run. And so I downloaded on my phone, well, the use of this is the transmitter, uh, not my phone. Uh, so I downloaded one of those uh, Couch to 5K apps. And so if you've driven by sometimes in the morning, uh, you may have seen me. And I just, I put my earbuds in and when the app, it's, timing and all that kind of stuff and when it dings it means run fat boy and then when it dings again it means you can now walk and try to get oxygen back in your lungs so here's here's the deal um I, i'm certainly not ready for a 5k by any means but even in the two three weeks that i've been doing this today i got out and did it and I had, a, I had two two-and-a-half-minute uh, runs as I ran around here. Honestly, three weeks ago, I could not have done two two-and-a-half-minute runs around. But what happens is you just you have to build up. And God does the same thing. It's the same thing. God, God is having to build up. We have to go through stuff. Why, why, did they, why did they have to cross the Jordan? Uh, the reason they had to cross the Jordan was God wanted to build their faith. God, they have to go through some stuff to build their faith. You know, everybody wants to, everybody wants to in theory, they want to run a 5K and get a medal and get a T-shirt and all that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, but in order to truly effectively do that, it takes some training. And in order to do that before I can 
do the 5K and get the medal and feel good about myself and post it on Facebook and all that kind of stuff. i got to get out here in the parking lot by myself and I've got to suck wind and I've got to stop and <laughs> after just running for a little while to build myself up to do it. And I'm telling you folks, faith that God operates our faith the same way. They had to cross the Jordan because he had more. He had a Jericho for them to defeat. There were giants in the land they had to defeat. And God needed them, this generation, to build their faith. And God's doing the same thing in you. You've got some Jordans in your life. You've got some things. God wants to take you to the next place. But God's going to have to put you through some stuff to build your faith to get you where you need to go. i got to be quiet. It's been an hour. Let's pray and we'll get off here. Father, thank you so much for tonight. Thank you so much for what you're doing in our lives. Lord, it is not your desire for us to stay in the wilderness. It wasn't your desire for the Israelites to say to stay literally in the wilderness. And it rep- was representative of you don't want us spiritually to be in the wilderness either. You want to take us into the promised land. Well, we know this side of eternity, that don't mean there's not going to be fights. There's not going to be times of aggravation and frustration. Uh, but it does mean that there's a better place. You've got something better for us. And, and I pray that you'd help us. I pray for folks listening tonight. And, and they're going through some stuff. They're crossing a Jordan. It's frustrating. It's aggravating. Uh, in fact, it may seem like a pure impossibility to them. But you're still the God of the impossible. You haven't slipped off your throne. You've not lost any power. Uh, Lord, they made sure. They made sure in that that we read in there, you, the God, the God of the whole world. Uh, that was clear in there. Like this is not talking about some little G God. This, the God of heaven and earth, the God that made the whole world. You, Lord, you're with us, and you're going to get us through this. And I just pray for strength. I pray for faith, O oh Lord, and every person that's listening to this tonight. Give them the help that they need to take them to the next level, to the next place. God, get them through what they're going through. Get us through this as a society, as a world. And Lord, when we get to the other side, let us remember as we walk, as we walk through those waters, you are right here with us, that you've been with us in this whole thing. And God, that you are the one that gave us the strength in order to do it. God, we just thank you. We praise you and we love you. In Jesus' mighty and precious name, I pray. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Don't forget all the things that are going on. So make sure that you're checking Facebook. Make sure that you're staying in touch with us. Uh, we want to make sure that we're staying connected in this time. And again, I'm looking so forward to the day that we all get to be together again. God bless you. I'll see you next time.